Hi, my name is Jasmine and today I'm going to chat to you guys about how you can successfully maintain a vegan diet while finding your food intolerances or IBS triggers. We'll be going through what IBS is, the low FODMAP diet as well as other IBS sort of triggers to look out for, um, how to combine a vegan diet with the low FODMAP diet, it is possible, and I'll give you guys a little look at what a day on a plate might look like when you are combining these two diets so that you can see how achievable it can be. A lot of what we do go through today comes from some frequently asked questions from clients so I hope it's all going to be very helpful. A little bit about me, I am an accredited practicing dietitian um, and to get there I did my Bachelor of Food and Nutrition and a Masters of Dietetics from Deakin University. I became a dietitian because I thought it was the perfect mix between working with health, science and food and I've really loved being a dietitian and helping people make food enjoyable again. I have a background in working with community health um, and disability before I came to work with Joanna Baker at Everyday Nutrition this year. So at Everyday Nutrition, we help people to understand their gut symptoms and gain back a bit of confidence again with their eating because we know that irritable bowel syndrome or IBS is very debilitating and can affect people's quality of life, which isn't very nice. So I've popped up our social media links on the screen there for you and our website as well if you ever need a dietitian consult. Um, you can just book online and we have online consults as well. So as you know, a vegan diet is one that avoids all animal foods and is centered around um, plant foods in the diet. While vegan diets have many health benefits, it can also be problematic for people that do suffer from irritable bowel syndrome. And this is because a lot of the staples on the vegan diet are high in something called FODMAPs. And this is something that I will be explaining a little bit more um, down the track. But if we have a lot more FODMAPs in the diet, that can um, trigger a lot more gut symptoms. So often people that are transitioning onto a vegan diet might find that they've got a little bit of an upset gut. Um, but it is definitely possible with the help of a dietitian to figure out your food intolerances and help manage those um, gut symptoms or your irritable bowel syndromes, even on a vegan diet. So first off, what is IBS or irritable bowel syndrome? Um, it is a syndrome that causes symptoms without any real medical reason. The symptoms that we see could include pain, bloating, wind, constipation, diarrhea, or a mix of all of above. As you can imagine, or maybe as you've probably experienced, these symptoms can be pretty debilitating and can affect people's quality of life. It can really affect being able to sit through school for the day, being able to concentrate on your studies. Sometimes you might have to take a sick day from work because these symptoms are just getting in the way of life. IBS is also pretty common, um, but it often takes people a lifetime of dealing with these symptoms before they do speak up and ask for some help. Since we don't know um, necessarily what the cause of IBS is, it is very hard to find a cure, which means it can be very frustrating for both the client, the GP, the dietitian, everyone involved um, in the care. So when it comes to our work with IBS as dietitians, our goal is to help people better manage their symptoms so people can get their life back. Most people with IBS have said that diet plays a huge factor in their symptoms. So you can really see the importance of having a dietitian on your team. The first step um, towards helping people figure out their gut symptoms is to actually find a diagnosis. So when it comes to IBS diagnosis, we need to be aware that the symptoms actually have a lot overlap with a lot more serious medical conditions that could be causing damage to the body. Therefore, we just want to rule out anything more sinister that could be going on. So it's good to get your GP, your doctor, um, to do a screen for celiac disease, inflammatory bowel disease and cancers. It's important to know that if you're going to go in for your celiac disease screen, um, it'll be a blood test. 
and we need to make sure that you're eating gluten at the time of that blood test. Otherwise, you'll return a negative test whether the disease is present or not. So there's many red flags that we look out for um, that might lead us to think that there could be something else going on other than IBS. If I come across a client with things like unintentional weight loss or rectal bleeding, um, if they're over the age of 50 or have some unexplained low iron levels, I'll be sending them back to the GP just to do a few more investigations, just to rule out anything um, else that might be happening there before we start working on dietary modifications. So once we have ruled out all the possible medical reasons um, for these sorts of symptoms, then we compare the symptoms to something called the Rome 4 criteria, which is where we then get our IBS diagnosis. Once we have that diagnosis of IBS, we can then start to investigate what is actually triggering those symptoms. So as you can see on the slide here with the mind map, um, it's quite multifactorial and there are many things that can play a role. Stress and medication side effects can play a big role. So it's definitely important to keep that in mind. From a food point of view, I will first check if someone's got a good meal routine, um, their portions aren't looking um, overly big, uh, before I then look at maybe making sure that they're eating enough fibre uh, and not too much fat, alcohol or caffeine because these can all exacerbate IBS symptoms. From there, then we might look at specific foods in the diet that are known to trigger some IBS symptoms, such as FODMAPs or food chemicals. So for today's presentation, I'm just going to focus on FODMAPs, but it's important to note that if the low FODMAP diet doesn't quite give you the symptom reduction that you're looking for, a dietitian can help you explore other possibilities, such as food chemicals. One food trigger of IBS symptoms is FODMAPs. These are poorly digested carbohydrates that pass through the digest digestive tract intact, and as they pass through, they can cause gut upset in some people. Often with a vegan diet and an increase in eating more plant foods, we also see an increase in FODMAPs, which could explain some of the gut symptoms that people might experience after transitioning to a diet like this. So FODMAPs act in two particular ways. Firstly, they're what we call osmotic, and this means that they attract water. When this happens in our digestive tract, that's going to cause bloating and lots of loose stools as well. So they're also fermented by our healthy bacteria that live inside the colon. And when this happens, the fermentation process gives off gas. And this is then going to cause bloating, um, pain, wind, as well as altered bowel habits. So FODMAPs actually stands for something. It's not just a strange little word. Um, so FODMAP stands for fermentable oligosaccharides, disaccharides, monosaccharides, and polyols. And each of those words just refer to a different type of carbohydrate um, that we do count as a FODMAP. As you can see from um, the examples of foods that count as FODMAPs, a lot of it is plant-based. So you can see that with a vegan diet, if we're having more and more of these foods, we might be causing a little bit more gut upset. So some examples um, of foods that are going to be high in FODMAPs include um, wheat, rye, barley, onions, garlic, uh, a lot of legumes, artichoke, um, honey, mango, watermelon, apples and pears, uh, lots of our stone fruit and cauliflower and mushrooms, as well as um, sugar-free or, or artificial sweeteners. Um, they can be high in FODMAPs as well. And milk is on there as well because it's high in lactose, but we don't need to worry about that on a vegan diet. So the only trustworthy way to figure out if FODMAPs are a food trigger for your symptoms is to actually go through an elimination diet. So as you can see, there are three steps to this process. Um, step one would be going on to an elimination phase where we probably do this for about two to six weeks and this is where we lower 
all of the FODMAPs in the diet uh, to see if we can get a symptom reduction for you. From there, it's important to then keep moving through the steps. And step two is called the challenge phase. And this is where we actually bring back in one group of FODMAPs at a time to try and figure out exactly what is triggering you. It's not very often that someone would be reacting to every single group of FODMAPs, so that's why it's important to try and figure out exactly what's going on for you. So then that will help you get through to step three, which is where we reintroduce everything that you do tolerate and maybe have a look at how much of those trigger foods we could bring in without exacerbating your symptoms. So it's really important that if you do do the low FODMAP diet to find your gut triggers, that it is just a short term diet. Quite often we see people um, come in for an appointment after they've been on step one, the elimination phase, for years, um, sometimes up to 10 years. Um, and we don't want to be doing that because that's going to increase your risk of nutritional deficiencies if you're on a quite a restrictive diet for too long. Um, so other reasons why we want to keep moving through the steps rather than just sitting on step one. Yes, it gives you symptom relief, but we want to keep moving through and finding out your triggers so we know your personal intolerances, we can help reintroduce a lot of the FODMAPs that aren't triggering you because that's what helps to um, nourish our gut microbiome and keep our gut bugs nice and happy. Um, of course, decreasing that risk of nutritional deficiencies if we can add back in everything that we can in the long run. And of course, enjoyment. The more foods that we can bring back in in the long run, the better. Um, and it's important to note that you can re-challenge as well. So say if you went through these phases and maybe you had a little bit of stress playing a role towards your symptoms when you were challenging and you got some conflicting results or some confusing results, you can wait until life settles down a little bit more and that stress decreases to then go back and re-challenge some of the FODMAP groups to really see um, if you can keep adding in foods because variety is definitely key um, to good health. So as we've discussed, um, many of the staples on a vegan diet are also high FODMAP foods, um, naturally just because um, those plant-based foods are, are more likely going to be high in FODMAPs. But the good news is it is definitely possible to go on the low FODMAP diet if you need to while still following your vegan diet. Um, to try and figure out your exact food triggers. However, it will be restrictive, so it's very important to work with a dietitian to make sure that you do have a good plan in place. A dietitian will also help you move through those different phases of the low FODMAP diet so you don't remain stuck on that elimination phase for too long. For anyone on a vegan diet, it is important to keep an eye out for key nutrients. Um, it's especially important if you're adding on another restriction like the low FODMAP diet. So what I'm going to do next is take you through some of the key nutrients that we do look out for on a vegan diet and um, look at ways to still include a lot of these foods even on the low FODMAP elimination phase. So the first nutrient of concern we're going to have a bit of a look at is protein. So this is really important for the growth and repair of cells um, making enzymes and hormones for the normal functioning of our muscles and our nerves, as well as our um, immune system as well. Um, we need a variety of different proteins um, in the diet to really achieve optimal health, and that's especially important for vegans. Many protein sources on the vegan diet are classically high FODMAP. Um, however, Rather than avoiding those high FODMAP foods, um, we can actually just look up certain serves. So a lot of high FODMAP foods can be low FODMAP at a certain serve. And the way we do that is um, using the Monash FODMAP app, which can be downloaded onto your phone. I think this is a really important tool to download if you are going to do the low FODMAP diet. And it allows you to look up individual foods and it'll tell you what a low FODMAP serve of that particular food is, even if it's a classically high FODMAP food. So an example is when it comes to legumes, 
you would have noticed that I mentioned that as a high FODMAP food earlier. But if we simply choose canned options that we then drain and rinse, that can help to decrease the FODMAP load. And this is because FODMAPs are actually water soluble. So the FODMAPs in those legumes are actually going to leach out into the canning liquid, which where they then going to discard and rinse off. And if we do that, that means we could start to include quarter of a cup serve of chickpeas or beans, such as lima beans or butter beans, or we could do half a cup serve of lentils or edamame, or even two thirds of a cup of sprouted mung beans. Uh, and that's a great way to um, increase your protein in, in the diet. We can also look at including soy foods, nuts at certain serves at, as well. They can be low FODMAP, uh, for instance, 10 almonds or about 40 grams of Brazil nuts or macadamia or walnuts um, or two tablespoons of peanut butter. Uh, and lastly, seeds are a great little protein booster um, and to... Uh, look at the low FODMAP serves of that, we would probably look at about a tablespoon of linseeds or a couple of tablespoons of chia seeds or pepitas. Um, so that Monash FODMAP app is such a great way just to be able to look up these little foods here and there um, and see what a low FODMAP serve could be. Next nutrient I'm going to touch on is iron. So iron is important for oxygen transport around the body and also for immune function. And this is found in many of the protein sources that I listed on the previous slide. Um, otherwise, uh, low FODMAP iron rich foods on a vegan diet can be found in legumes, tofu, nuts, seeds, um, iron fortified foods such as some cereals, breads and milk alternatives as well as green leafy vegetables like spinach and kale uh, as well as whole grains as well like our quinoa or brown rice or some rolled oats. So when it comes to plant-based iron this is what we refer to as non-heme iron. And this isn't absor absorbed as well as the animal sources, which contain heme iron. So what we want to do is really maximize how much of these iron foods we do get through the day. So including a little bit at each meal or snack can be a great way to give yourself a few more opportunities to get a little bit more iron in. And there's little things that we can do to help increase the absorption of the iron as well. So the, the big thing is pairing these um, sources of iron foods with vitamin C because this helps, to, um, this helps with the absorption of the iron in the body. Uh, so some examples of some vitamin C foods that you could add in as well could be our citrus foods, strawberries, kiwi fruit, tomatoes, broccoli or capsicum. Um, and some things do inhibit the amount of iron that we're going to um, absorb and this could be things like tannins from our tea and coffee, um, foods that are really high in calcium or calcium supplements or phytates which are found in some whole grains and legumes. But if we work on adding in that vitamin C, that will help to overcome these effects. So that just shows the importance of aiming for really balanced meals with lots of variety. Um, so each different food could kind of work together. This nutrient of concern is calcium. So calcium is very important in the diet because this is key for strong bones, teeth, proper nerve and muscle function, as well as helping out with blood clotting as well. So very important nutrient. So some low FODMAP vegan calcium sources um, include some calcium fortified milk alternatives such as soy milk made out of soy protein. Make sure to get that one because that's going to be the low FODMAP option. Otherwise almond and rice milk as well. Definitely double check the packaging of these plant-based milk alternatives because calcium isn't naturally containing in these. So we want to make sure the calcium has been added in. And a little trick that I like to use is when I'm at the supermarket, I just do a little bit of label reading using that per 100 grams or 100 mils column 
and compare the calcium um, content to the cow's milk. So then you can just have a bit of a look and make sure that um, it does have enough calcium added in. Otherwise, we can also find some calcium in our almonds. So 10 almonds is a low FODMAP serve. Brazil nuts, sesame seeds, uh, tahini. So tahini, we can have a tablespoon for low FODMAP. Um, as well as calcium set firm tofu. So again, having a look at the ingredients list for your, um, your firm tofu to see if they've used some calcium in there to help set that, that's gonna be very helpful. And then we've also got Asian greens, kale um, and collard greens as well, can be quite helpful for your calcium intake. So a few little tips in terms of helping with the absorption of calcium. First off would be to just limit your salt intake because as we excrete salt, so if we are having too much salt in the diet and the body is needing to get rid of some of that salt, it actually pairs with calcium and takes the calcium out with it. So helping, um, if we limit our salt intake, that's just going to help us to absorb that calcium. Um, and limiting caffeine intake, so in tea, coffee and Coca-Cola, as this can also inhibit your calcium absorption as well. Then we've also got omega-3 and B12 that we'd like to look out for as well when we're on a vegan diet. So omega-3 fats play a really crucial role in good health and help to protect us against lots of different diseases in a number of ways. When we're looking at low FODMAP vegan omega-3 sources, this would be looking at things like a bit of flaxseed oil, hemp seeds, walnuts, uh, coconut oil, seaweed, that firm tofu again that we mentioned with the calcium, um, as well as chia seeds, lots of different things to choose from there that you can kind of add into your diet for your omega-3 fats. And then vitamin B12 is another one. Um, so B12 is very important for um, the division of cells, producing red blood cells, and as well as our general nervous system function. And B12 is mostly found in animal products. So it is quite a hard one to maintain through food if we're on a vegan diet. So this is one that we probably um, should be looking at incorporating a vitamin B12 supplement um, into your day. So with that all said, you're probably thinking, how do I actually put that all together into my day today? Um, so this is an example of a vegan low FODMAP day on a plate. Um, so this is just an example. You don't have to follow this to a T. Um, this is actually from our Everyday Nutrition Instagram page, which is at Gut Health Dietitian. Uh, we share lots of different food ideas on this Instagram page, so feel free to give us a follow. So as you can see with each of these options, getting enough protein on a low FODMAP and vegan diet is definitely doable. Um, and some key tips here are that uh, nuts and seeds are used to help boost protein, those healthy fats, those omega-3 fats, and also iron as well. So they're great to sprinkle um, at those low FODMAP serves after you've looked those up. And nutritional yeast is added at lunch for a bit of extra uh, vitamin B12 as well. You can see that there's a variety of foods in each meal and snack. So this is really going to help make sure that the nutrients can all work together to help with that absorption. So eating out. Um, for everyone in Melbourne, it's very exciting that we're out of lockdown now and we can start to eat out. But for those on a low FODMAP diet, this is one of the most common questions that we get, how to make eating out a little bit easier. Um, and especially if you've paired that with the vegan diet as well. So the two diets together, as you can see, gets a little bit restrictive and can be confusing. Um, but it's definitely doable to eat out. Um, it can be a little bit tough to find options, but my top tips are to eat lower FODMAP earlier in the day, so then you can relax a little bit when you do eat out. Um, read menus before you go. Most places share their menu online, so you can have a bit of a research and, and look up what's available. And don't be afraid to call ahead and ask a few questions and make sure that they do have some options for you. 
if in doubt, have a little look elsewhere um, and, and see what somewhere else might be able to do for you. Uh, it's very important to remember that the low FODMAP elimination diet is only short term. So this means that you should be moving through those phases that we spoke about to find your personal triggers rather than sticking on that elimination phase, that first phase for too long. Um, once you do this, eating out is going to be so much easier once you know your exact food triggers to look out for rather than trying to keep the whole low FODMAP diet in mind. Um, and the low FODMAP diet as well, it's not about being perfect. It exists to help people better manage their symptoms. And we know that FODMAPs don't actually cause damage to our gut or to our health. When we eat FODMAPs, they're going to cause symptoms. But as soon as we um, excrete those and go to the toilet and get rid of um, those FODMAP foods that we might have eaten, those symptoms are going to disappear down the toilet with it. So relaxing your dietary restrictions a little bit so you can eat out will not be detrimental and it might just be about making sure that you do have a bit of a self-care plan in place in order to manage any flares. So that might look like getting a really good heat pack, um, drawing yourself a nice warm bath or maybe enjoying a bit of uh, peppermint tea to look after that sore stomach. And remember to enjoy yourself when you do eat out because pleasure and enjoyment is just as important as nutrition. So that is all from me today. I hope this has helped you see that going through the different phases of finding your food triggers of your gut symptoms is definitely possible, even on a vegan diet. But as you've seen, there is a lot to consider and it's important to make sure you do reach out to a dietitian to help you along the way. It's always good to have as much support as you can get anyway. So you can find me on Instagram at Jazz Nutrition. Otherwise, the rest of the Everyday Nutrition team can be found at the Gut Health Dietitian or on Facebook at the Everyday Nutrition Facebook. Um, we've also got a Facebook group for those that do need to go through the Low FODMAP diet. That one's just called Low FODMAP Australia. And that's a great community where you can ask about different food products or little questions that you might have to help you along the way. Also, great, great place to find some good meal ideas and things like that as well. Um, and that Low FODMAP Australia um, group is run by dietitians, including myself. So you know that all the advice that is up there is going to be quite trustworthy. Um, and then if you do need to find yourself a dietitian, um, whether that's myself or, or someone else from the Everyday Nutrition team, uh, you can head over to our website and book an appointment there. We've got plenty of online consults, meaning that we can see people all over Australia or even across the world if needed. Well, thank you so much for your time and hopefully you're able to take something away from today's presentation.